Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mind Body Greens Beauty Podcast, Clean Beauty School. I am your host and Mind Body Greens Beauty Director, Alexandra Engler. On this podcast, we explore beauty through the lens of well being. And on today's episode, we have on Sandra Chu. She is an acupuncturist, an herbalist, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And I am so excited to learn more about her story and her practice and you know how we can all better take care of ourselves, especially in this new year. So I am very, very eager for this episode. So without further ado, Sandra, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you again for joining. And, you know, like I just said, I'm so excited to hear more about your story. This is our first time chatting. So, you know, in the interest of getting to know you better and having the audience get to know you a little bit better, what was your journey into traditional Chinese medicine? What did that look like? Well, I think that it starts in childhood, actually, because um, being Chinese American, Um, I grew up with a lot of the principles and traditions of traditional Chinese medicine just as part of growing up. So a lot of these medicine wellness ideas are taught to you by your mom. Like, you know, my mom, when I was little, she would be yelling at me not to go outside with my hair wet or what am I doing outside without a scarf around my neck? And things like that and forcing ginger tea down me when I was feeling ill. So these things are very much part of Chinese medicine. And they're also very much part of the culture, which is such a beautiful thing that I love about the medicine. And so my exposure to it started extremely early. And then later, I was actually bound for um, pre-medicine. So in college, I was pre-med and I thought I was going to become a medical doctor, at least attempt to become a medical doctor. And then something just didn't feel right about that path. So I went a different road. And that road eventually led me to medicine, but not Western medicine, Chinese medicine. So, and part of that road there was having an experience in sort of corporate America. I used to be an investment banker and experience what it felt like to be off your path. And, you know, I mean, you could say that being off the path is part of the path because it helps you see what it is that is you're actually aligned to in your life. And at least that was the case for me. So being in the investment banking world, being in the corporate world was a huge learning experience, but it was not a place that was designed for me. (laughs) And so after you know, having a bit of a health crisis because of being in a place that was too stressful, um, being in a work environment and just in a, the, the goals of what I was doing just didn't align with what I wanted to do in life, what I felt was meaningful for me. So all of that made it quite a stressful time in my life. Um, but it was such a purposeful time for me because it made me turn to Chinese medicine for help. And what I found through Chinese medicine was more than I expected. And so that's what eventually opened my eyes to this beautiful medical tradition and practice that not only helped me get out of pain, because I had a pain condition that was constant and stubborn. And there was just no other solution except for Chinese medicine at the time. So it just opened my eyes to what was possible. And it was not only that my pain could be relieved, but that I felt like I was brought back to life because I felt like being in such a stressed out state, being in such a chronic state of stress all the time, I couldn't access parts of myself that that were more joyful or more purposeful, right? And so it helped me access that part of me. And I felt alive and I felt good in a way that I hadn't for ages or if ever. And I think that that's tremendous in a medicine, you know, because when you think about Western medicine, which I grew up with, 
I took antibiotics for sinus infections. You know, I went to the pediatrician if something was wrong and it never did that. Like it never opened up dimensions of yourself that are there that, um, that are part of who you are, you know? And so I feel like Chinese medicine helps you access parts of yourself and recognizes that you have these other dimensions of yourself, like a spiritual self, an emotional self, a physical self, that when you kind of turn all of those systems on in a way that you're, you're looking to thrive, then um, you just feel like, I think what we're supposed to feel like as human beings and often don't because the world that we live in is quite stressful and it can be easy to get lost in that stress. So I think that's a long way to say that the journey here was um, partly cultural, you know, being born into a Chinese family and, and just seeking part of seeking what was truly me. Right. So I'll say that over because I feel like it was hard for me to sort of find those words, but I think, so part of the journey was early family life, experiencing Chinese medicine through the culture and also, you know, just finding myself. And I think that I've always been destined for this because I feel so connected to what I do, but I didn't find it right away. I went a different route that helped me find where I am today by discovering what didn't work for me. And that's the important part of healing is knowing what doesn't work and making sure that you're, um, you know, filtering your life in such a way that you're always moving towards what does work and, and away from what you know doesn't work for you. Yeah. And I do want to like highlight something that you said that actually really resonated with me is that stress cuts off certain parts of yourself or it cuts off access to certain parts of yourself. Um, I think that's a really important thing to, I don't know, chew on and sit on just because I, I, that deeply resonates me. And I don't know if it resonates with me just because uh, I'm, it's that time of, you know, it's a period of my life where I need to hear it or what, but I also just think it's something that a lot of people probably need to hear right now. Um, because it does, it really, you know, stress can really limit, uh, limit yourself. Um, and it's important to, uh, to practice stress management in a lot of ways, not just because it reduces stress, because it opens up different facets of your being. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. And it's that difference between surviving and thriving, right? Because like when you're in the stress state, you're just trying to survive and every you're reacting to what's in front of you. And being out of the stress state allows you to be more creative and be more proactive. And that's possible. And that's something that we all can access. We all deserve to access. It's just you have to find the way there because life doesn't automatically teach you to learn how to thrive. Yeah. You know, I'm also curious um, because I know a lot of your practice today does center around skin and, you know, beauty aspects of it. So what was the draw there? You know, were you always interested in beauty in some ways or did that come later? You know, how did you kind of like meld these um, modalities together with like a skincare practice? Well, initially when I began practicing, I was a generalist, as many Chinese medicine practitioners are. And it wasn't until later that I became interested in skin and the cosmetic use of Chinese medicine. And I think where that came from was as a generalist, you see so many different kinds of disorders, everything from back pain to neck pain to fertility issues to heartburn to period pain, all of it. And I started to notice that my patients with skin issues, the solutions that they were being given from Western medicine didn't feel like it was speaking to what they needed. And so I started to observe that there was a gap for skin health in Western medicine and what was available to most people, including my patients. And I felt like 
you know, Chinese medicine fills in a lot of those gaps because it looks at the skin from a whole body perspective. And it's not just about trying to change what is happening at the surface, you know, whether it's eczema or rosacea or, or acne or whatever kind of inflammation is happening at the surface. There are things happening under the hood, under the surface that have to be acknowledged and addressed. And Chinese medicine is all about that. So I felt like this is a puzzle that my brain was interested in um, chomping on and chewing on. And it is challenging to choose to focus on skin is a challenging choice because skin is very tricky. You know, just like bowel disease is very tricky and they're very much related. Joint disease is very tricky and also related. So, you know, I chose a very challenging focus, but um, I really believe in the principles and the wisdom and the approach that Chinese medicine offers for skin. So I became kind of obsessed with treating skin with Chinese medicine. And I'm not only interested in helping inflammatory disorders resolve, but also extremely fascinated with the possibilities of cosmetic work using Chinese medicine. Because What's beautiful about using a Chinese medicine approach to cosmetics is that we always have to bring into the conversation the health and the vitality of the person. You can't have beauty without that. And that's a really important message for people today because you can improve your health. You can improve your vitality. That is accessible. It's, you know, it, I feel like it feels more possible sometimes than when people think, oh, I need this procedure in order to be beautiful, or I have this thing. There is this thing outside of me that I need to purchase or I need to somehow grasp. And I think that health feels different. Your health is accessible. There are pathways, easy pathways, easy roads to improving your health. Um, whereas with cosmetic and beauty, it just, I feel like there's a lot of anxiety in the industry because it's a lot of people feeling like something's missing, especially as we age. And with Chinese medicine, the approach is improve your health, build your, build your vitality. That's the key. That's the game. That's what the game should be. And I feel like that's a much more empowering way to approach beauty and skin than what we're doing in the Western world. No, I completely agree. I think one of the things that I often struggle with with the beauty industry is how often we relinquish our control over to you know external forces. Um, and I think it's like a very purposeful thing that happens in the beauty industry because you know if you can portray yourself or as you know, the one solution that somebody needs, or this treatment is the one solution that somebody needs, then, you know, you, th there's profit in that, or, you know, there's, th there's something to benefit from that. Um, and so I think a lot in the beauty industry, we, we purposefully, or, you know, subconsciously, we, we, um, instill this idea that the way you look and the way your skin looks and you know how you age and how you do all these things are are somehow outside of your control you know you you don't have much power over it it just happens to you aging is this thing that is you know it's external it's forced upon you it's like you know you don't really have uh that control that you know we're talking about and i do think that I would like to think that there is this shift happening where people start to realize that, you know, so much of how my skin looks and so much of how I feel and so much of how I age is in my hands. Um, and it does require, you know, the daily care and the daily maintenance and these lifestyle adjustments and, you know, leaning into a whole host of um, avenues, but it is there and it is possible. And, you know, I think, 
I would like to think that that that's happening, or I would like to think that that shift is coming. Do you feel that way? I mean, you know, you're so much more in it. So, you know, like, what are you seeing? hundred percent. And I mean, the, the only part that I'm not able to gauge is how much that messaging that you just described is reaching yet. But I feel like people, like the people that I see, everyday people are hungry for that approach because it's just too stressful. It's too much of a tension situation um, to engage in like beauty culture right now. It's all about what we're not and what we could be if we bought something that's outside of ourselves, right? But here's the beauty of the Chinese medicine message is it's within, everything is within, it always has been. Since the moment you were born, you came into this life with your energy, your life force, your purpose, your spirit, all of that. And that means something. And we don't account for that in the beauty world. And we should, because that energy is what people engage with because we're really relationships, right? And and I love that that's what you, you said about like, you know, how daily care is important in our well-being and improving our well-being and establishing well-being. And that's really about a relationship with yourself, right? It's about having a supportive, nourishing, nurturing relationship with yourself. And so, you know, all of these things, your spiritual self, your emotional self, it's all about relationships. It's it's exploring what the meaning of these dimensions of ourselves are. And it's the energy that comes from feeling full and vibrant as a whole being, right? So in Chinese medicine, we're thinking of the whole being. And that's what we need to talk about in the beauty industry. It's not just the procedure you do to your skin. It's not even just the gua sha stroke that you do for your face or the needle that you put in for a facial acupuncture. It's about more than that. And we have to talk about it as more than just that. Um, so that's what I love about Chinese medicine is because in order to understand who we are and our relationship to the world that we live in, we have to go there. And I think that that's a really important and beautiful place to take people to in this conversation and journey to beauty and self-care. Yeah. You know, everything you just said, I think speaks very um, accurately about, you know, your practice that you have today. Cause you know, when I, when I look into it, it's, it's kind of this mix of products, courses, you know, various treatments. How did you create this like multifactorial, multi-layered um, approach with your practice? I think that it's about coming from healing clients, right? So it's a coming from the standpoint of being a healer, of being a practitioner, where my job and my goal is to help you, let's say, if you're my patient, not only overcome and recover from a physical issue or disorder that you might be having, but how do I help you thrive from there, right? How do you maintain the results of the work? So if you came to me for something cosmetic or something inflammatory, like let's say acne, my job is not only to help you resolve, let's say the acne, but how do I help you maintain that result? And what's necessary for you to maintain that on your own? Because I don't want you to need me, right? I'm just here as a guide to help you see the path and walk it right? I'm not here to do it for you. And I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to support. So the ideal situation is that you can go into your life and as a result of the work, have more knowledge and more motivation and um, just more wisdom around what's next for you so that you can thrive in your life. So maybe that means your acne resolves and out of your acne resolving, now you know how to take care of your skin health, but also to take time for yourself because of what you did to resolve your acne, let's say, right? Or for someone else 
who's has a more cosmetic goal, we have to think about for them, or I need to think about for them, not only what am I going to do to improve the jowls, the look of the jowls, let's say that's a very common concern, or what am I going to do in treatment to help the wrinkles get softer? Like I have to think about that and I have to deliver on that, but that's not enough. I want you to be able to create that skin health on your own at home because you can't see me every day or every week for the rest of your life, right? So it's out of wanting to give my patients solutions that they could then take over their care and learn how to bring important aspects of self-care and skincare into their life that all of this multifactorial, multi-layered um, offerings came about. So when you come to Lanshin, you will experience treatment you know, like an actual professional service, as well as education about how to maintain your health, your skin health, your body health on your own at home. Cause that's really important. That's where most of the work lives. And um, because being healthy and having well being is your job, actually. And I'm just here to guide, right? So, um, so that's where the education comes from. And then, of course, the products and the tools are there to support your home practice. So the ideal situation is that you learn how to take care of yourself really, really well. And that you can tell me, you know, after experiencing, you know, your self-care practice, what works for you? Maybe you discovered something that really works for you in your gua sha practice that I didn't discover because you're so deep in your practice. So um, but that's why I think it's important as a brand to have these different offerings because it's about supporting people through an entire journey and not just one piece of it, right? It's not good enough for me that you just today you your wrinkles are softer. I want to make sure that in a month you can help yourself maintain that and learn about how to care better for yourself in a bigger way that isn't just about a wrinkle, but is about your relationship to yourself and what are you doing to care for it? Yeah. You know, I'm so excited to get into some of the, um, you know, the more nuances into what people can do to take care of themselves. And, you know, we'll certainly talk a lot about that today, but before we do that, I, I want to ask, uh, this question, cause I think it like sets up the, t or I think it, you know, it helps set up, um, uh, some of this conversation in that, you know, I think so many of these traditional Chinese medicine practices, such as Wuxia, um, have become much more a part of the Western zeitgeist, which, you know, I think, I think obviously is a good thing. But when that happens, oftentimes, um, perhaps people aren't getting it exactly right. Something, you know, it gets, gets lost in translation. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what do you think out of these modalities that have kind of entered the Western beauty sphere? Like what, what are we getting wrong right now? And like, what sort of things do you wish, or like, would you like to address? Oh, thank you so much for that question. I think that it's a really important question to ask. And I so appreciate you as part of like journalism that you are asking these questions and, um, seeking, you know, people like myself to talk about and represent Chinese medicine, you know, those of us who are actually trained and actually have clinical practices. And that might seem obvious, but that's not how things began. You know, we weren't the ones called upon to answer for, well, what is gua sha? What is cupping? And because of that, we've lost our way a little bit with what they are. The beauty industry is defining these traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM for short, practices in a way that we don't recognize as Chinese medicine practitioners. And the thing that is a shame about that is that you as a consumer and you as a person experiencing this practice that you might love and think is beautiful and really like intuitively fits your life, you're learning about it in a way where you don't get to access its power because it's through learning about it authentically through how traditional Chinese medicine understands gua sha, understands cupping, that you really get the value, right? And, and the accuracy, because we've become untethered from accurate, you know, information about 
things like gua sha cupping, for instance, you know, I've seen things like people claiming that gua sha can reshape your nose and, you know, people really putting gua sha forward as like a cellulite reduction tool. And that really, you really lose the plot there when you are only thinking about gua sha in those ways. And because the beauty and cosmetic industry is so powerful, these things go viral. And so now a lot of the culture, when they hear the words gua sha, they think a cosmetic hack, right? It's this thing that's going to erase my lines and, and going to reshape my nose or, or erase my double chin, which isn't exactly, exactly accurate, nor the intended purpose. So when the beauty industry is excited about these practices, I think that's exciting. I love that the beauty industry is um, interested in these practices. I just hope that going forward, that when we want to learn about these practices, that the industry will think, okay, where is this practice from? And who would be the appropriate person or community to seek knowledge and information from? So initially when facial gua sha first took off, I remember this because as a Chinese medicine practitioner, I was really quite um, confused at why I kept reading about gua sha in articles that would feature people that had no training in gua sha, absolutely no training. And we're talking about it as lymphatic drainage, which is still today the case for gua sha. And as a Chinese medicine practitioner, it is not a lymphatic drainage technique, yet everybody in every piece of press you've ever read talks about it as lymphatic drainage. And even medical doctors now I'm being quoted in articles saying, oh, gua sha improves lymphatic drainage. And it's like, it's not inaccurate. It, it does improve lymphatic circulation, but that's not the main point or the power of the technique. There's so much more to gua sha than that. And I wish that, you know, and I wish and hope that going forward, people can learn about it straight from the source which is Chinese medicine practitioners. And, um, and you'll get to learn about a tradition in a different way that not only um, that can open your mind, because when we talk about what is gua sha, we have to talk about what is qi, right? And qi is life force energy. You have it within you. It runs through a system of, of network. It runs through a network system within you. And it's that network system of energy is what communicates be your is the communication system between your body and the outside world. It's amazing when you learn about what chi is and how it operates in your body. And so when we just talk about it as a lymphatic drainage technique, you're missing that entire conversation about chi. And it's important. And um, if you're a practitioner of gua sha and you're not understanding it in that way, you can't be as effective as a practitioner of gua sha. So um, I think that, you know, the beauty industry hopefully has learned, and I think that I, I really am seeing this. So I'm very hopeful and um, I feel like really appreciative that people like yourself and a lot of editors are really understanding this now. And so um, I'm seeing a lot more Chinese medicine representation um, in articles and press about Chinese medicine. So this goes for gua sha, it goes for cupping, it even goes for herbs, because there's a lot of these herbs that I will read about, you know, in the way that they're used in Western products. And I just don't recognize that function or action. You know, it's a very Western way of looking at an herb and its function. And this is the case for so many of the Chinese medicine practices. So that's a long way to say, um, you know, I think that where we've gone wrong is by not looking to the actual professionals and experts in Chinese medicine for information about our practices. I, I think what you said about, you know, honing in on the idea of lymphatic drainage um, as being like this one thing, this like one talking point that keeps on getting belabored over and over again about how like, yes, it's technically true, but it's not the whole picture. I think that's really 
really fascinating. Um, and you know, that it certainly got me thinking because it's like, it's a perfect instance of yes, it's factual, but it's not the truth, you know, and like the difference between factual and the full truth. And I do think that that is like, I don't know. I just think it's important to acknowledge the fact that something may be technically factual, but it's not all of it. Yeah. It's kind of like what's happened to yoga where we think, um, you know, if you are young and you're just learning about what yoga is, you might think, oh, it's a fitness modality. It's about working out. Yoga is so much more than fitness. I mean, so much more. And to only understand it from the perspective of being a fitness modality is unfortunate because it's this beautiful practice. I can't speak for it because I'm not a true yoga expert, but I know enough that it is also a modality that where you experience the spiritual side of yourself and that that merge of spirit and physical body. And that's so much of what Eastern practices are about. And so in the same way, I think that's happened to Gua Sha where it's like people think, oh, it's lymphatic drainage, just like they think yoga is fitness. But if you just, if you care to discover more and research more, you'll find, whoa, this thing is amazing. It's way more than what I thought it was. And, and that's why people are so fixated on um, this idea that Gua Sha is for removing a double chin, which is not that accurate. And um, it's, but it's because they think, well, if I can drain the lymphatics, then I can remove my double chin. Now that in itself is a little factually inaccurate, but you know, to, to, because, you know, a double chin isn't about lymph stagnation. You know, there's so many other factors that create a double chin, like, you know, fat pocketing. And even things like posture. And posture. So, so, you know, that's why we, have come to understand gua sha is something that is much more of a cosmetic hack than this beautiful healing tradition that has the potential to change and create a cosmetic result, um, but is also way more than that. And so that's what we're trying to educate people about. Yeah. I also just think it does these modalities a disservice by only, you know, talking about it in terms of like, oh, it will remove your double chin or, oh, it can ease fine lines because it sets it up in this way that's like, unless you have this very specific cosmetic outcome, then then like, oh, it doesn't work. And the entire point of Gua Sha from the beginning wasn't that. So how can you use that as your marker of it working? Oh my God, I love that you said that. Exactly. And that's that's the potential problem that we have is that people think, yeah, it's this cosmetic hack. So if I don't get the fine line erased, then Gua Sha is a joke or it's pseudoscience as I've seen on TikTok. And it's not. Um, If you understand it from a Chinese medicine point of view, it is a really fascinating and effective healing technique that is worth exploring and experiencing. And um, it's not a joke, you know? So, and, and by the way, just as a quick aside, I think that it's interesting in the beauty world, there's so much emphasis on lymphatic drainage and a lack of understanding of even from a lymphatic drainage technique point of view, people don't quite understand lymphatic drainage. It's a very light technique and everything gets called lymphatic drainage, but it's actually a pretty specific technique. So I just hope that people start to talk about that because so many things that are not lymphatic drainage become termed lymphatic drainage. And I'm just like, what are we talking about? <laughs> let's get accurate, you know, and let's understand what we're doing so that we can really use them effectively and safely. Yeah. You know, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of these practices and modalities that you uh, perform and, you know, you are an expert in. Um, 
Acupuncture, I, I think, is a, a great place to start. I think, um, you know, as we know, acupuncture has many, many benefits, a wide variety of benefits. I think it's certainly, um, I, I, I think a lot of people are certainly waking up to the fact that it has um, skin and facial rejuvenation benefits as well. Um, certainly, that's something that you practice um, or that, you know, you perform within your practice. So I want to ask about acupuncture's role in skincare and you know its role in facial care i think that what acupuncture is um showing us is that the importance of circulation in beauty is something that we haven't thought about enough and is a reality right so we often talk about in beauty collagen elasticity skin cell turnover all important things to talk about because they are part of skin function and skin structure. But also what Chinese medicine says is, hey, but we also need to talk about this because there, so we know, we understand we need to think about structure. So collagen, elasticity, and we need to talk about function, skin cell turnover, for instance, but we need to also talk about circulation, which is what feeds all of that, right? And so what acupuncture brings to the table is a way to enhance improve circulation and what it's very simple actually and it goes back to a very basic foundation idea or principle rather in chinese medicine which is that kind of circulation is everything we have a saying in chinese medicine it's um when things circulate there's no pain or illness where there is pain or illness there's no circulation so you could say that we're obsessed with circulation in Chinese medicine and acupuncture is such an effective and rapid way to improve circulation, not only of the blood system, but of the qi, right? The life force system. That's a very important thing that we're tapping into with acupuncture. And the simple result of improving the circulation of your chi, of your blood, of your fluids as well, is an improvement in the beauty and the appearance of your skin. It's very fast. And I first noted this when I used to do a lot of, of back treatments where I was using acupuncture to um, you know, break up stagnation in the back. So muscle knots and really, really tight areas that just barely could move properly and just really stuck, rigid, tense parts of the back. And what I would notice is when I would needle them, the skin looked so beautiful after, you know? And, and it wasn't because I put any kind of product on, it was from the acupuncture work. So I'm just applying all of the things that I observed in treating the body to the face and the skin. And so I think it's really um, bringing this idea and understanding of circulation forward. And we should all be thinking about that when we're thinking about our skin care as well as our body care. And that's what um, you see Chinese people doing all the time. Like when you see Chinese people in the park in the mornings, you, you know, doing their exercises, their movement, their chi exercises, it's because we want to always create good movement and improve the movement and the circulation within ourselves for our health. So the same exact thing applies to the skin. But what's so extra about that when you apply it to the skin is all the things that we're looking for in a procedure or in a product you get when you improve your circulation. So I think that's my main um, point about not just facial acupuncture, but all of the Chinese medicine practices, it all brings circulation forward. We've talked a little bit about gua sha already, and you know, we've noted uh, some of the misconceptions that we that we have in the industry. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, we we've talked about circulation, about qi, and all this sort of stuff. So, what are some of the um, the benefits people the you know, the actual full picture benefits that people can uh, expect to um, perhaps see if they adopt a gua sha practice at home. And then, you know, when you talk to your uh, patients um, and your clients, you know, what 
what sort of basics do you give them so they can continue their practice at home? So with gua sha practice, um, what you can achieve at, through a home practice, and I should first distinguish between facial gua sha and gua sha. So I think it's important for people because nowadays you just hear the term gua sha. Gua sha is actually a medical technique. It's it, it's very serious, right? It's you can get pretty marked up with like red rashy looking expressions of the skin, which are normal in the practice of gua sha. But if you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what that is, you shouldn't mess with it because it's medical. So I should first say that that type of gua sha, I tend to refer to it as medical or traditional gua sha. You shouldn't do at home unless you're a practitioner. You should go see a practitioner and have it done professionally. Or if you were born into an Asian family and it's been passed down through your mother and your grandmother, et cetera, obviously, you know, that's a different story. And um, those of us that grew up in Asian families do have that background with gua sha. So um, with facial gua sha, that is a much safer type and style of gua sha that you can do at home. And what it offers you is a way to of course, to improve circulation in your skin, but also to release the tension in your facial muscles that over time lock you into um, a a certain kind of face shape that as we get older, our, our shape changes. So when we think about aging cosmetically, it's not just about wrinkles, right? Or the texture or the elasticity of the skin. It's also the shape of the face because tension over time reshapes our face into how we are living, right? So if we're living a lot of tension and stress, we're going to see the jowls. We're going to see the 11 lines. We're going to see a heavy lower face because of all that jaw cleansing. So Gua Sha offers you a way to release that tension pattern so that your face can restore itself to where it naturally is. Because a lot of those things like a heavy lower face, um, you know, jowling that is a result of excess jaw tension, that's not our natural original face. That's our face after living stress, you know, too, too excessively. So we can use gua sha to release some of that tension and restore our face to who we are. And so, um, so it can also offer that as well as circulation. And um, it's also offers soothing the nervous system. It's a very helpful technique for um, mental and emotional health as well. So I like to say it offers emotional skin health. Ooh, I like that. That's a good phrase. Emotional skin health. Um, You know, you are obviously also an herbalist, as we've mentioned before, and I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of your your favorite herbs, um, specifically in regards to the beauty category. So, you know, for skincare or hair care, you know, what are what are the herbs that you tend to to look to? I'm sure this. Uh, varies a lot based on, you know, who your, your patient is, but, you know, are there, are there a certain set that, you know, tend to be your favorites? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a different answer if we're talking about internal herbs um, versus topical herbs. So in Chinese medicine, there's- We believe in both here. So- So internal herbs is probably regarded as much more important for skin health when you're trying to heal or resolve a chronic inflammatory skin disorder, you're going to get much more efficacy and power from internal herbs than topical herbs. Though topical herbs have a place in in skin treatment and TCM dermatology. So with internal herbs, there it just varies. It depends on the condition and it depends on the person with the condition. So the favorite herb would the answer would be depends on the person and and their condition what herb would be the best suited for that person so that is so varied right and but but it's a good i really like this question because it helps people understand that in chinese medicine it's not just oh antibiotics or oh steroids it's no they're so nuanced and that's why chinese medicine is powerful is because it 
acknowledges and recognizes nuance and layers of person. And so, and we can treat and speak to each one of those layers and prioritize which layer is more important right now. And that's going to change in the process. And then we can change and move with you as you change. So Chinese herbal medicine is very individual, bio-individual. Topically, different story. Um, you know, there tends to be a lot of herbs from Chinese medicine that are used that I really love. So one of them is Sika or um, tiger grass, as it's sometimes called, Ji Shui Tao in Chinese medicine. I think that I love seeing that in formulas because it's so anti-inflammatory. We use it for treating acne internally um, as well as topically. So that's a fascinating herb. I like to see it in skincare. Um, I love bakuchiol or bakuchiol. I don't even know what the right pronunciation is, but that is also a Chinese herb that comes. It's called bugu de in um, Chinese herbal medicine. And um, oh wait, did I get that right? Sometimes I space out on the <laughs> yeah. It's a it's an herb that we use in vitiligo treatment. So it really has a strong effect on you know melanin and it's used a lot as a retinol alternative now so it you know there's something about the way it supports skin cell turnover um but i love seeing that in uh topical formulas because i love using the power of chinese medicine or i love seeing that people are using the power of these herbs in topical skincare um ginseng is another ingredient i like to see um, God, there's so many, but some of those are some of the top that come to mind. Also licorice, licorice Pao in Chinese medicine is, um, is like used a lot in brightening formulas, but it kind of has this, one of those herbs that is just so good for the skin on so many different levels that it's hard to pinpoint one thing. So I love that about herbs. And I really believe that, um, going forward in the future, that there's a lot of the things that we're seeking in skincare, you know, when people think about retinol and vitamin A, they're looking for that like powerful anti-aging effect because of its way of supporting collagen, elasticity, skin cell turnover, blah, 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 you know, sebum regulation, all that. And you can find that in herbs. So, um, you know, we're starting to learn more about how to translate herbs into a topical action because it's different when you use it internally and when you use it topically. So um, I think that there's more and more research and understanding about, you know, how they work and how you need to combine them in topical formulation. So um, that's really exciting. I'm super excited about TCM skincare in the future. And I think it's going to be a big part of um, skincare. I do too. And also, you know, I think that especially for those with chronic skin conditions, you know, like your acnes, like your eczemas, like it is so important to address it from, you know, both internal and external because, because it is a chronic condition. And I think sometimes people forget that element of it, that like there's not going to be one solution to solve or manage these conditions because it's chronic. That's the nature of the disease. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think that approach is what makes it, you know, these modalities so successful is because they approach it from, you know, a long-term approach and a management approach rather than, you know, quick fix. Um, yeah. The last thing I want to talk to you about is how you take care of yourself. Um, we'll start with skincare and then, you know, we can move into the other areas of how you care for yourself. But, you know, what what is your skincare routine? Well, I use all of the tools because that's why I made them, <laughs> you know. So um, I think that circulation is an important thing to um, build and improve and maintain in skin. So I do gua sha regularly. I also do facial acupuncture on myself regularly. Um, I also work with facial cupping, which I don't teach a lot about because I think that cupping, you have to be really careful. It's a little bit trickier than gua sha. So, um, but I do use it on patients and myself. Um, I love using heat, whether by heating up 
a nephrite jade tool or our lanching massager. I think heat is also an underutilized technique um, in caring for our skin and our body's health. So um, very powerful to bring in the power of heat into relaxing tension and improving blood flow. So I use all of those things. And then I am very selective about my skincare. So I use all of those tools to not only help penetrate my skincare products, but also to enliven the circulation. So I'm doing that um, as close to daily as possible. And, um, and yeah, I think that it's very simple at the end of the day, but it, you just, it, the key is uh, regularity and persistence. Yeah. You know, the persistence and the regulatory regularity, I think is, you know, such an important point to drive home. Um, you know, taking care of your skin day in and day out is how you see the changes that you want to see and how you take care of your skin long term. Um, the last thing I ask about is how, you know, you take care of yourself as a whole. Obviously, the practices you just mentioned do are a part of that. Um, but in this question, you know, it's more about the uh like lifestyle, well-being habits that you consider an essential part of your routine, whether it's, you know, sleep hygiene or movement or nutrition. Um, I'm sure all of the above on some level. <laughs> As a Chinese medicine practitioner, I know that the basics get you so far. Like we don't need to bother with too much beyond the basics of sleep, good nutrition, movement, hydration, which is part of good nutrition, but those form the basics and, and finding moments of joy and pleasure, I would add, these are the basics. And if you were to just to focus on those 90 to hundred percent of the time, you would be amazed at what you can create for your wellness and your skin health. So I, I focus on those things because the basics are tough to master in modern life. So I say just focus on the basics, master the basics, and you will be so far ahead. And um, the final thing I would say is, and f follow nature. I, I follow nature. If I, in the winter time, nature says rest more, right? That's what the animals are doing. That's what daylight is telling us to do because we have less daylight. So we have less yang energy, we would say in Chinese medicine to support us. So follow that and surrender to that cycle of nature and sleep more, sleep earlier, rest more. As my martial arts teacher once said to me, if you don't take the time to rest in winter, you will create anxiety for yourself for the entire rest of the year, because this is the time that your body needs to restore in terms of the season. Cause we have to restore seasonally just as we do nightly through sleep. So that's an example of how to follow nature is by following the energy and the reality of the seasons. So that's another, you could call that a basic in Chinese medicine, but is mastering the basics. And even I'm challenged to master the basics as a busy practitioner and founder, you know, that's not the most glamorous life in reality. I love that you acknowledge the fact that sometimes mastering the basics is like, it is challenging. It's hard. It's, um, you know, we call them basics, but sometimes they don't feel like basics. <laughs> so I think that's honestly a very honest way to look at it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, sometimes we need to like cleanse or declutter and we can do that to our wellness, the way we think about wellness too, because, um, you know, if you look online, you would think that you have to take every supplement out there and you don't. Just, ma just focus on the basics. Well, I think that's a beautiful note to end on. I just want to say thank you so, so much for joining me today. I loved this conversation. I I really, really did. I, 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 You shared some very profound insights that I'll be thinking about for a while. And, um, you know, I hope everybody at home felt the same way. I'm sure they did. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy we got to have this conversation. Thank you. Me too. And I could talk with you for hours. There's so much we could we could discover and explore through a conversation. So um, perhaps we will do so again. Yes. Well, we'll have to get a part two on the books. <laughs> a neat time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. I appreciate this.